Well, I want to thank everyone for being here this evening. I'm very appreciative of the invitation, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, but especially appreciative tonight for the many visitors that we have who have traveled to be here, uh, to come out and to support the efforts of this congregation here in Jamestown, uh, as well as holding up the hands uh, of, of the preacher here. And it's a tremendous encouragement to me. Uh, the song service tonight, as it was uh, throughout the day yesterday, has been a tremendous encouragement. I'm just so thankful to be able to be here. Uh, thank you for your prayer, JR, uh, not only on my behalf, but on behalf of Jennifer and uh, my family as I'm away from them. I already miss them terribly, and those of you who are preachers here know exactly what that's like. But I am, uh, at the same time, it's, a, uh, it's bittersweet because I love being able to be with brethren and meet new people as I have been able to here. I'm so encouraged by the work that's going on in this uh, uh, greater area of the Indianapolis area. I know that we're well outside of it here, but uh, it's still so encouraging, not just what's happening in the, in the greater metro area, uh, uh, but, but even out here in these uh, smaller towns. I'm just so encouraged by the strength of the churches in, in communities like this. Uh, as I was growing up in Oklahoma, uh, most of the, the sound churches were in, uh, in the metropolitan areas. And it, it's so encouraging to be able to come out to a, a, a farming community or at least to a rural community like this and to find uh, faithful elders and, and so many deacons and brethren that are working together. Uh, so I commend this congregation, but really the, the brethren in this area, uh, it's, a, it's a great encouragement to me. I didn't realize that we were going to be having scripture reading, so I'm going to be able to advance through a few slides here with you, and that's going to, I know you're thinking, wow, well, maybe his sermon won't be so long tonight. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I appreciate the, the scripture reading and, and everything that's been, been done uh, to help with this gospel meeting. Obviously, our text here from Luke chapter 16 deals with uh, a, something that Jesus uh, tells about, and of course, it was spoken after uh, the Bible tells us about how the Pharisees were lovers of money. And Jesus expresses to them one of the dangers of that as he tells about Lazarus and the rich man. And I know that there has been a, a lot of discussion and there's a lot of lessons from this particular text. I'm not even going to go into all of the various ways that we could examine this and the lessons we could draw out of it. What I want to look at is really the point that we need to see as we get down to especially verse 30 and in verse 31, where uh, Abraham says to the rich man, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And, and the rich man's request was to send Lazarus back from the dead to warn his brothers, to warn his family. Uh, I've, I've expressed many times in preaching a sermon, I remember in the first year of preaching out in West Texas, up in the top of the Texas Panhandle, I, I, there was a gospel meeting that was going to be held in Amarillo, Texas, and that was about two hours away from me, but I, I would make that drive, being in the middle of nowhere, to go to the gospel meeting. But I was unable to go the night that uh, the, the topic assigned was, or the topic that was announced, was what's worse than going to hell. And I thought, I, I've got to hear that sermon. Well, I, I was hindered from being there that night, so I asked a local preacher, I said, what did that preacher say was worse than going to hell? He said it was from Luke 16, and he said, what's worse than going to hell is being there and realizing your loved ones are heading there to follow you. And I thought that was profound. That, that's something that we see that this rich man is going through. And because of that, he's compelled to find some way for his family to be turned from coming there. And it reminds me, it, it makes me think about the fact that, you know, when we are uh, uh, speaking uh, in, in honor of one who has died or in, in, uh, just in a, in a funeral of one who has died and realizing that there are family members, usually what we preach about at a funeral is what happens after death. And the fact that this is something that God anticipated and that he has even prepared for so that we could be prepared for this day. And we talk about the gospel and what that means. And, and I've, I've actually heard brethren who have criticized a gospel preacher for preaching a sermon at a funeral that they said beat people over the head with the gospel, people who were unbelievers. And, and, I, and I said, there's, first of all, no way you can beat someone over the head with a message of love. And when you're warning people, I, I want to tell you this rich man did not think that his brothers were going to be beat over the head if someone warned them about where he was. One thing that we know, and that is that if a person dies in a lost condition, they want more than anything 
that their family be warned. Don't ever criticize someone who is warning the loved ones of a deceased person about what awaits them. That's exactly what he wanted Lazarus to do. But I, but I want you to notice that Abraham's reply to him was, no, they have Moses and the prophets. Now, they had Moses and the prophets in that they had their inspired writings in the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, the inspired word of God. And that's what, Mo, uh, what Abraham is saying to the rich man. He said, they've got the inspired word of God. They, they don't need Lazarus to go back from the dead. They have all that they need in order to be turned from going where you've gone to. They have the same thing that you had. What's interesting is the rich man believed that his family needed more than simply the inspired word of God because that's what Abraham was telling him. He understood it. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will be persuaded. You know, I, I think about this and I remember a time in my life and in my early 20s, I'd moved down after college, moved down to Dallas-Fort Worth, and, and I, wasn't, I was going to church, but I wasn't really living faithfully. And I was worldly in my life. I was trying to stay under the wire because my parents kept a pretty close eye on me. They, all the way up in Oklahoma, they had people they knew down there. And, and so I was going to church, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, these, these old moss-backed preachers, they don't get it. They're preaching on Bible authority and, 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 and God's word is this and God's word says that. And, and the people that I work with out in construction, they don't cotton to that Bible thumping preaching. You're not going to save those people. That, this, this is not what turns them on. And you know, that's, that's to some degree what I believe the rich man was trying to argue here. And that is that his brothers needed something other than the gospel, something other than the word of God. And that's exactly the way that I viewed it. I worked with people in the oil field and in construction. They had no interest whatsoever in gospel preaching. And so I began to think, you know, what these people need is something else to reach out to them with. Maybe something social, maybe something novel, something that, that's going to get their attention, something that they would be interested in. The rich man's idea was to have someone go back from the dead. And that that would be sensational enough to attract and to convince his family. And I want you to think about it. Is it that far off? I mean, what do you think? If you were to have announced throughout the community here that you're having a gospel meeting and the visiting preacher is going to raise someone from the dead or someone's going to come back from the dead one night of this gospel meeting, don't you think we could probably have all these chairs filled? I bet there'd be a lot of people that would want to come out for something that sensational. And so we might ask, why, why would Abraham not agree to send Lazarus back from the dead? The reason is because someone did go back from the dead and they wouldn't hear him. They rejected Jesus who was raised from the dead and the reason was because they were not honest about the truth. And those who are honest about the truth don't have to have someone come back from the dead. Someone already has. And there are sufficient eyewitnesses to that fact. And therefore, everything that needs to be known can be known. The main point of this text is the sufficiency of God's word. And I know that that's a statement. It's a phrase that maybe you've heard many times. You think, oh, that is one of these sermons again. We, we've heard this so many times. I want to tell you, you can't hear it too much. It is the very foundation of the Great Commission. It, it is the very foundation of everything that we do, and that is that God's Word is what supplies life. It is, it is the seed of life. The seed of the kingdom is the Word of God. And I fear that we don't preach it enough today that there are generations growing up that this is more of a foreign idea to them. What does sufficiency mean? Let me tell you, young people, the idea of sufficiency is the condition or the quality of being adequate. And what Jesus was telling in this is that the word of God is adequate to convert the rich man's brothers. And it is adequate to convert your friends and your family members, and it always will be. We don't have to do something different in this day and age than what they did in the first century. The word of God is absolutely sufficient. And you know, this is not the only text that teaches that. Look with me, turn over to Isaiah chapter 55. Now we're familiar with verses eight and nine that tell us that God's ways are not our ways. 
that his thoughts are not our thoughts. But notice here in verses 10 through 11, in Isaiah 55, in verses 10 through 11, Isaiah says, For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God says, it's just like the snow and the rain. You know, there may be times where you think to yourself, I think we've had enough snow. <laughs> Kansas City, we get that feeling a lot. Or you might say, hey, we've had enough rain, you know? I mean, the, the soil can't hold anymore. But what's interesting about it is God says, you know, it doesn't come down and go, whoop, they've had enough rain, let's go back up. It comes down, and if there's been enough rain here, then it runs off, doesn't it? Fills the tributaries. Streams, the lakes, it, it, all, it fulfills something. It, it fulfills purposes. It, it fills the, the, the underwater or the underground aquifers and all of this. God has a purpose. And we may not always see what it's doing, but God says it is sufficient to do exactly what I intend for it to do. And so is his word. It'll accomplish, did you notice that? It accomplishes what I please. Now listen to me. God's word will always accomplish what he pleases. I've been asked many times in returning from a gospel meeting, Brett, was, was it a successful meeting? And my answer is, I, always, yes, absolutely. Well, were, were there any baptized? Well, not always. Any restored? Not every time, no. Sometimes there are meetings where there is no response to the gospel that is visible, and yet, it was a success. And the reason why is because if the word of the Lord went forth, it accomplished something that pleased God. Let me give you an illustration, an example. This is an anecdotal illustration here, but I spoke some yesterday about an earlier time in my life, and I just mentioned it, about moving down to Dallas-Fort Worth. And during those early, early 20s years, when I was struggling with worldliness and with my own faith and, and my walk with God, I just wasn't living like I ought to be living hanging around the wrong people. My brother and sister-in-law were in the Fort Worth area, and I decided I needed to worship somewhere else because they were a little too close. He was an older brother, and he's keeping too close now on me, so I, I placed membership somewhere else. Well, they had a gospel meeting, and they invited me to come over to the meeting, and so I, I, I went over and, and went to the meeting with them that night. And that preacher, and I won't name any names, but he was the longest-winded preacher I've ever heard. And... He got up there, and about five to ten minutes in the sermon, I thought, my brother told him about me. And he preached that whole sermon right at me. I was livid. I could hardly speak. I left that meeting just boiling, and I had to come back the next night and see if he'd do it again. And he started in on chapter two. And he preached to me all night. And, and I went back every night of the week, and by the end of that week, I was humbled. Yes, I'd been preached to. No, my brother hadn't said a word to him about me. The thing is, he could have preached from A to Z from the Bible and he'd have hit me somewhere at that point in my life. But I requested the tapes of that meeting and I literally wore them out where they, they wouldn't work anymore. You, you couldn't hear them. I listened to them so many times. What I'm, what I'm saying is that that meeting was a turning point in my life. And I will tell you right now that I would not be here holding this meeting. I do not believe I would be preaching the gospel had that not happened when it happened. I was on a road of no return. I didn't go forward that week. To my knowledge, not one person was baptized that week. Not one person was restored. But I want to tell you the word of the Lord accomplished what he pleased. It made the biggest difference has possibly ever been made in my life. And you know when the church there found out about it? When I went and held a meeting there. And it was a number of years later. I want you to realize that when God's word is preached, it accomplishes something that God intends. 
it is sufficient to do what God intends for it to do. And so what we've got to do is simply find out what does God intend for his word to do and trust that it's sufficient without our schemes, without our solutions. We don't need to shore it up. We need to preach it. And then, as Paul says to Titus, we need to adorn it. What does God say that his word is sufficient to do? I want to start there. First of all, God says that his word is sufficient to draw men to Christ. You know, we want, to, we want our friends, we want our children, we want everyone that we know to be drawn to Christ, their Savior. It's not just a formality. We want them to draw near to him, to know him, to believe him and to put their trust in him. But how are we going to accomplish that? There are a million ideas about how that's going to be done. Now, we realize that in the denominations, they believe it has something to do with a mega church or, or a handout, and even many of our brethren have believed that it's something social, it's something novel. We've got to have a, a hot dog supper or a pizza dinner, and, and a lot of those things are not nearly as popular as they used to be, but it's still all entertainment. It's still the idea of appealing to, to another part of man in order to, to draw them to be able to, to maybe somehow be converted. I want to tell you, that's not the Bible plan. The Bible's telling us that it is the word of God and that that is actually sufficient to draw us to Christ. I want you to notice with me in the book of John, in chapter 6 and verses 44 through 45, Listen to what Jesus said, John 6 and verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now notice that. Uh, uh, charismatics will see that word draws him and get the idea that this is some better felt than told experience. But the bottom line is, it is the idea that there is some power that is able to draw someone to the Lord. And he said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I'll raise him up the last day. Okay, hold on. How's the Father do that? I want to know that, don't you? Well, look at verse 45. He's going, to, he's going to tell us. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. He states in verse 44 that you can't come to Jesus, that is, be drawn to Jesus unless you're drawn by the Father. Then in verse 45, he tells us how we do it. When we hear and learn from the Father, that's how we're drawn by the Father to Christ. Here's a clue. Did you notice he said it's written in the prophets? He's not just stating this here. Jesus says, you know this. This is written in the prophets. Where is that written in the prophets? Well, among other places in Isaiah 2. You're familiar with the text in Isaiah 2, beginning in verse 2. Turn over there and notice in Isaiah 2. We're going to read verse 2 and 3 that you may have memorized. You're familiar with it, but notice how it correlates to John 6. In Isaiah 2 and in verse 2, he says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days. We know that we are now in the last days, and that's what was identified in Acts chapter 2, that it was the last days, the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. He says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. That was the establishment of the church, the Lord's house, 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. And he says, all nations will flow to it. That's what happened in Acts 2 and further in Acts chapter 10 and so on. But look at verse 3. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now here's what I want you to key in on. This correlates to what Jesus said in John 6. It's written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. You can't come to the Father unless the Father draws you, and you're going to be drawn when you're taught by God. It's written in the prophets, they shall be taught by God. How are we taught by God? Look at verse 3. He said, the law, the word of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem. That's when they will be taught. He will teach us his ways. How? When the word of the Lord goes forth from Jerusalem. What was that? That was the gospel preaching of Peter and the apostles on the day of Pentecost. When those people heard the gospel, they were taught by God. Indirectly, he revealed that word to the apostles by means of the Holy Spirit. But when they were taught, 
They were essentially taught by God, and 3,000 people were drawn to Jesus Christ and were saved on that very day. That's the point that is made there. Listen to the psalmist in the 43rd Psalm. In the 43rd Psalm, and in verse 3, the psalmist said, Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and your tabernacle. Did you see that? Let them lead me, bring me. What is his light? Well, it's truth. It's a metaphor for truth. The word of God. It is that light that shines. The, the light of God's word. And he says that, that that light, the word of God, is going to lead us, it's going to actually bring us to God's holy hill, to his tabernacle, which is his, his dwelling, his house, the church. Once again, saying the same thing that we saw back there in Isaiah in chapter 2. It is the message of God that the Bible assures us is sufficient. Jesus, as a matter of fact, Jesus said, no one can come to God unless he is led there by means of the word of God. That's it. You know, in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2 and in verse 14, Paul states it this way. He says, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that idea of being called is used a lot in denominationalism, the idea that, that maybe we just got some feeling, some idea that we need to go into, into preaching and that, that we'll say that person got their calling. The Bible says that all Christians are called and they're called, the idea of being invited by means of the gospel. That's how they're drawn. It, it's through an, an invitation. And it is an invitation that is unique. This is the way that, that God is able to, uh, has figured out how to do this. He uses, he crafts an invitation that invites those who love the truth, who are spiritually minded, those people who, who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And those people are drawn, they are called, they're invited, and they are drawn to Christ. Oh, let me, let me emphasize that if we're going to draw people to Jesus today, it's not going to be through some slick salesmanship methods. It's not going to, I, I, we need to take care of, a, of the building wherever we meet or the location. We need to keep things up. We need to maintain the parking lot. I'm not saying that, but I'm going to tell you that's not going to draw people to Jesus Christ. Now, that may be a first impression. They might say to themselves, well, these people really take care of what they own, you know. That, that's a good thing. I, I mean, we, we ought to be that kind of people. That doesn't draw people to Christ. We're drawing people to Christ when we are sowing the seed everywhere we go. And it's not just the preaching that's done here in this pulpit. It is the teaching. It is the lives that are lived day after day, wherever we are, taking the word out and sharing it. That's how people are going to be drawn to Christ. And, and I really believe that a, that a large part of this effort for a social or an entertainment-based method of drawing people is because so many people don't want to have to go out and spread the word in their daily life. They, they want some mechanism as a part of their religious institution that can draw people in and fill that building up and feel good about it because, hey, look, I'm part of a, a popular crowd. I mean, a lot of people like this. I must be doing something right. That's just not what it's all about. It's all about sharing the gospel. God's word is sufficient to do that. But secondly, I want you to see that God's word is sufficient to save those who are lost. And you're familiar with this, Romans 1 and verse 16. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That idea of power, dunamis, and, and to, that is, that is unto, into, or toward. The same word translated for in Acts 2 and in verse 38. It is the way into salvation. It is by means of this word of God. Jesus speaks about the fact in John chapter 3 and verses 3 and in verse 5 that we will be born of water and of the Spirit in order to be born again. The Spirit's part of that is through the word. James chapter 1 and in verse 18, he has begotten us by way of the word of God. He is, he is uh, that, that new birth is by way of the word of God. First Peter chapter one 
Verse 22 and following, we've been born again by means of the word of God. It is God's method of saving. It has that power. John chapter 5 and in verse 25, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. He's not talking about the physical resurrection. He talks about that in verse 28. He said, do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear the voice of the Son of God. Yeah, that's going to happen in the resurrection. But he said, there's another resurrection that now is, verse 25. And that's when the dead, the spiritual dead, hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear or give heed to it are going to live. It has that power has that power. It, it touches the heart. It convicts. It pricks the conscience. What people see with the word of God is something completely different than all of the schemes and the wisdom of men. We've got to trust that. And, and I'll bet you've had visitors here that when they come and visit, they hear the preaching here. They say, you know, I haven't heard anything like that in years. I, I remember when I used to, I remember when I used to hear preaching like that. And they're refreshed by it. That's because when we preach the word of God in its simplicity, it is powerful. Now, I know that there are a lot of speakers that are powerful speakers. And it just makes you feel good to listen to them. It, it comforts you. you. You just feel good about yourself. You feel good about the day. I, I realize a lot of people have that gift. The word of God goes far beyond that. The word of God is able to touch something within us that convicts us and that moves us, that creates fear in us in a positive way. It is a fear that is godly, godly fear. You know, the apostle Paul stated in 2 Corinthians and in chapter 5, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It moves us. Uh, that, that cannot be done with the wisdom and the ideas, the after-dinner speakers that are so popular today that are posing as gospel preachers. We need the word of God and we need men who will hide themselves behind the cross of Christ and project the word of God and not themselves. I am so weary of self-promoters. I don't care if, it, I, uh, obviously in denominationalism, but brethren, we need to stand up and reject that every time within the church. And when there are young men that are gifted speakers that are veering down that road, we need to lovingly take them aside and say, I want to tell you something. This is where you're going. And I know you may be a Pied Piper and it may feel good and everybody's grooming you and telling you how great you are, but you are on a road to disaster. We've got to put our faith and our confidence back in the word of God. It is what is going to save people. And not only will it draw people to Christ and save the lost, but it is the power to edify or to build up the saved. That's what he tells, Paul told the elders there at Ephesus in Acts 20 and verse 32. In Acts 20 and verse 32, Paul said, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. The word edify, I, I realize, especially some of the young people here, you might think, yeah, what is that word? I hear it at church all the time. Edify means to strengthen or to build up. Uh, the, the noun, the edifice, is a strong building. Edify is the verb. It means to strengthen or to build up. And so, so Paul is saying, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. That's like the word of the cross, the word of salvation. It's the word of God. He says, which is able to build you up. That's what you're going to see throughout in the scriptures is able to build us up. Like 1 Peter 2 and in verse 2, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. The pure milk of the word, not adulterated, not, not something that's been polluted by the ideas and the opinions of men, but the pure milk of the word. You're going to grow. You're going to be strengthened as a result of that. 2 Timothy 3, we're familiar with verse 16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, unto every good work. That's the idea of strength. That's building us up. And this is not just some type of a, a, a Sunday school or Bible class memory verse. 
This is not just a formality that, oh yeah, we've got to remember that the word of God will, will build us up. This is real. This is a fact. We draw near to God and it builds us up. Now, I, I, some have said, well, Brett, you know, I, I've heard that and I, I see that in the scriptures, but you know, I've, I've read my Bible and, and, and I've gotten my Bible lesson done, but, but I still, I, it, it's not there. I'm not feeling it. I mean, I, I'll go and, and partake of the Lord's Supper and, and it's just empty. But I'm doing my lesson, I'm reading my Bible, and you're telling me that this is going to build us up? Well, let me make sure that you understand with this caveat. It's kind of like faith saves, well, when it's coupled with obedience. When we say that the Word of God will build us up and strengthen us, that is conditional upon your obedience to that Word. We've got to make sure that we're doing what God says. Remember in Matthew 7 and verse 24, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine will be strong like a house on a rock. Is that what he said? He said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now look at verse 26. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. What was the difference in these two men? Was it where they were born? Was it, was it gender? Was it race? Was it, was it financial background? One difference. They both heard the word of God. One did it, one didn't. That's it. So yes, when we're talking about the word of God building us up, let me assure you that to the degree that you know and you've heard God's word, you've got to do it. You've got to obey it. And as you're growing spiritually, there's going to be so much that you know and there's going to be a lot that you don't know yet. You obey what you know. And that's when you're going to be given more. You know the parable of the talents? He says the same thing there that Jesus says after the parable of the sower. And the parable of the sower is all about God's word being sown and our reaction to it determining what fruit we, we uh, bring forth. And so what he's telling us here is, the more that I do what I know, the more that God's going to add to what I know. And the more that I do what I learn more, the more that I'm going to learn even more. That, that's just the, the principle of it. And that's how we're being built up. I'm not saying there's some kind of osmosis that if you just sit in here, put some earbuds in or, or, or just sit there and, and don't engage yourself, but you're hearing the gospel that you're going to somehow be strengthened. It's not going to work that way. You do need to be wherever you need to be to hear the gospel, but you have to be obedient to it. But it is the word of God that is going to be the genesis, the seed that germinates, that brings forth that life and that edification. There is no other way to accomplish it. And once again, that's not going to be done through a basketball game. That's not going to be done through some social or entertainment event. It is through or by the word of God. And again, the text in Isaiah 55 and verses 10 through 11, where he says that God's word will accomplish what he pleases. You remember what precedes it? Verse eight and nine, for my ways are not your ways. God is saying, it's almost as if he's anticipating the fact that people are going to say, well, I know God said that, but God says, this is my way. This isn't the way you would do it, but this is my way. And my ways aren't your ways, and my thoughts aren't your thoughts. You say, well, I don't think God says, I know. You don't. Your thoughts aren't my thoughts, and this isn't how you would draw people. People say, well, you know, I'm in business. I'm in sales. I know how to draw people. God says, not to Christ. Not to Christ. And if people are being drawn by those schemes, they're being drawn, and they're being drawn to something, but it is not to Christ and salvation. So that begs the question, why then doesn't God's word draw more people? If God says that his word is sufficient to do it, why doesn't it draw more people? Well, there are a number of reasons that are revealed in the New Testament. One being that there are a lot of people that just aren't spiritually minded. 
But what I mean by that is they are not interested in things that are eternal or of a spiritual nature. If they can't touch, taste, smell it, if they can't spend it, they're not that interested in it. In John chapter 6, remember in verse 60, it says, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said this is a hard saying, who can understand it? What was Jesus speaking about there in the text? We just saw in verse 45, uh, 44 and 45, he was talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Remember? That was a spiritual lesson. They didn't like that. They did, they did not like that. They said, I, 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 don't, I don't know about this. And in verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Drop down to verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. It's because they didn't have an interest in those things that are spiritual. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to look at this a couple of times, so you might even put your little ribbon marker there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll be in chapter 1 and chapter 2. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, remember where he talks about how no one knows the deep things of God. God has to reveal them to us, and he's done that through his spirit. And he has given those things to the apostles. Paul said he's given these things to us in words which the Holy Spirit teaches. And in verse 14, he said, the natural man, and that, that word natural is the idea of a, a carnally minded man. It's a, it's a fleshly minded or a, or a here and now minded person, a person who is not interested in things that are spiritual, things that are eternal. He said the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because, why? They're spiritually discerned. I, I know a lot of people, they're just, they just don't even want to talk about things like that. It's, they're just not interested. I tell you, you'd as soon get a, a buzzard who's gorged on a dead animal to eat something as you would to get those people to have a Bible study with you. Uh, they're, they're just not it. There's no hunger. There's no thirst. There's no desire whatsoever. Listen to Paul in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8 and verses 5 through 7, Paul said, those who live according to the flesh, he's talking about the temporal life. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God nor indeed can be. There's no way that you're going to get a person to submit to the gospel until they are minded of spiritual things. And I just look at the world around us and, and I'm not saying this to say, well, give it up, guys. We're not going to convert people. I'm telling you, I'm still seeing. I mean, over the last couple of years, I can't tell you how many times we've had someone converted that is as unlikely a prospect as I could ever have imagined. People are being baptized that we wouldn't dream would be interested. Yes, the run of the mill where we're seeing society go, the progressivism all around us, it's it's insane what people are, are, are thinking. But should it surprise us when Romans chapter 1 speaks about the fact that when people don't retain God in their mind, what happens to their mind? I mean, it's just, it's given over to foolishness. But that doesn't mean that everybody is. There are people out there that you would never dream would be interested in the gospel. They just need to hear it. They need to see the transformation the transforming power of the gospel in your life, and they need to hear it. Yes, people are not spiritually minded. They're not going to be subject to God. And, and there are people that don't care about the truth. I mean, all you've got to do is listen to politics for just a little bit, and you realize how many people in our country no longer care what the truth is. They care about their party. They care about their, their cause. They care about their person. They don't care about the truth. And I'm going to tell you, that's not a one-sided deal either. There are people on both sides of the aisle that don't care about the truth. They just care about who's, who's going to get paid and who's going to benefit from this. And, and this is not a political sermon by any means. I'm just saying this is common around us. Things have changed. There was a day in this country when people cared about the truth, but it is less and less. And, and 
The Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says in verse 10, that with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. People who don't want the truth, God's going to, you, you know, the, the Old Testament, remember that, that God has set before them life and death. We all have a choice. God says, you can have the truth or you can have deception. Which one do you want? If you don't love the truth, there's a strong delusion out there. And we see a lot of people that are, I don't know of any word to describe it better than just delusional. They're delusional what they believe. Why? They don't love the truth. And I can't make someone love the truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 7, Paul speaks about the latter days, perilous times, the latter days in which we're living now. He said that there are those who are always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Yes, they don't love the truth. And I'll tell you, thirdly, there are some that even if they knew the truth, they wouldn't be willing to do it. You know, this is something that I, I didn't really understand until that period of time that I spoke of earlier when I'd been living so worldly. And when I finally started finding my way out of that, I realized that in order to know what God's will was, I was going to have to be willing to obey it regardless of what it was before I knew what it was. <laughs> I, I was... I used tobacco during that time in my life and I was adamant that there was nothing wrong with that and nobody could show me in the Bible where that was wrong and I just couldn't believe it. And, I, and I, would, I would pray to God, I would say, if there's anything in my life that would come before you, please help me to know what that is. And my conscience would say, well, there is that tobacco thing. Well, besides that, if there's anything, <laughs> because I know that's not wrong and it wouldn't go away. And I finally realized, you know what? I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to sacrifice this thing to be sure, you know? I'm going to have to raise my, my hand and that dagger over this and give it up and show God. And, and I pray, please help me to be able to see if this is right. <laughs> please show me that this is right so I, I can go back to it once I've given it up. The reality is that I had to give it up to have the objectivity to be able to see it for what it was the depth of the addiction, the worldliness of it and everything else. And that was a lesson for me to see that what it took for me to be able to see was for me to commit to the Lord, I'll go wherever your truth takes me. I may not want to go there. And this may not be what I want, but if this is where you say go, at your word, I will. And it's a lesson that we all need to understand and, and this is what Jesus was saying in John 7 and in verse 17. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. I've studied with people and say, well, Brett, I just can't see that. <laughs> you know, you can see through a screen door, you can see that. You know, baptism for the remission of sins. The fact that God created the world. I mean, the evidences are all there. And it didn't matter how many ways I would prove it, which verse I went to. I'd, I'd knock down this argument, knock down that argument. I'd make this proof. Here's this witness. And they, well, I still just don't see it. Well, that tells you something. They're not willing to do it even if they did see it. And that person's never going to see it. That goes back to that passage in 2 Timothy. They're always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. They just don't have the will to do God's will. But then there are others that are just not willing to abide in his word. They, they might love the truth to a certain degree. And there may be a lot of God's word that they love, but they're not willing to abide in it. They're not willing to be contained by the authority of God. They're not willing to be corralled or reined in by the doctrine of Christ. In John chapter 8, Jesus said in verse 31, he said, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You know, we quote verse 32 so often, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. But we forget that it is a conditional promise. It's conditioned upon verse 31. If, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples, number one. And number two, you shall know the truth. If you don't abide in my word, what does that mean? 
you won't be my disciples and you won't know the truth. There's deception and, and that's where it is. And I can't overcome that. that. That is an attitude of heart that that person has to overcome. But I'll tell you what can. It is the power of God's word. The power of God's word overcame Saul, the persecutor. The power of God's word has overcome the greatest of sinners. And it can overcome the attitudes and the, uh, uh, and the uh, desires of anyone in this world. But they're going to have to surrender their will. But God's word can prick, it can convict, and it can do that very thing. What I want you to see is that God's word accomplishes exactly what he intends. That's what we saw in Isaiah in chapter 55. But I want you to notice what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11. Because people say, well, Brad, I, I mean, I'm with you. Amen. I know this is true. But I just wish we could get more people to fill this building. And, and why aren't there more people that are interested? Listen to Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, in verse 25. After he had preached the gospel in several villages, he answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. Jesus said, this is the way God intended. You see, God crafted his word in such a way that a person who doesn't will to do his will, who's not spiritually minded, is not going to see it. it. It's going to be vague to them. But that same message to a person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, who is an honest person who seeks the truth, he just hasn't seen it yet, it's going to be as clear as day to that person. And that's why the different reactions in people that we study with this is, this is the power of God's word, but it's also the will of God. But here's the problem. We've already seen that it was God's will that people who don't love the truth, people who don't will to do his will, people who are not spiritually minded are not going to be drawn to him. Here's the problem. There are some people who have decided to try to help God accomplish something that he never intended to do. You know, it's kind of like when Sarah decided, we haven't had a baby yet. I think God needs my help. And she gives Hagar to her husband. She created a mess that we're still living with. And it's all the decision that a person thinks God needs my help. And here's what's happening. There are people that are looking around and seeing carnally minded people that are not drawn to Christ by the preaching and the teaching of the gospel. And they decided... I know how to draw them, and they've come up with carnal means to draw them. And they're getting them to church, but not to Christ. And that is the very foundation of the social gospel. And God never intended to draw people who don't love the truth or care about spiritual eternal things. And so they're drawing people with carnal, carnal means. What are some of the things that are, that are happening? You know, it, it reminds us of of what we see with the, uh, uh, even with the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man wanted sensationalism. He wanted to send Lazarus back from the dead to try to convert, uh, uh, bring his brothers back. That's not what was going to do it. You know, the, the Jews seek after a sign, Jesus said, <laughs> and no sign will be given to it. You know, there, there are those that, that today believe that, well, what we need is, is we just, we need some sensationalism out here. You know, in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1 and in verse 22, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22, he said, the Jews request a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But what God gave was the gospel. It was foolishness to both the Jews and the Greeks, but it was the power of God to those who are being saved. You know, there are a number of different ways that people are looking for this type of sensationalism. One of the ways that, that we see that it's being done is, is by means of, of dynamic speakers. We, we want to try to impress people with the speaker. Have you heard brother so-and-so? And as I was talking before about those who almost seem to be a Pied Piper, everybody wants to hear this person. Have you heard so-and-so's podcast? Have you, have you uh, uh, heard this person in the gospel meeting? Look, if you're talking about the power of God's word, 
that is conveyed, I'm with you. Amen. Anyone that will boldly proclaim the word of God, let us hold up their hands. But let's not make it about them. And if they're a godly, faithful gospel preacher, they don't want it to be made about them either. They want it to be about the gospel and about Christ. But you know, this, this idea of, of these, these dynamic speakers, you know, this, this idea of, uh, it's really the idea of a gimmick. It's the idea of using something that is going to reach people, that, that's, that's going to grab them by their emotions and bring them in. You know, we're warned about these things. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 2, in verses 1 through 5, Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I want you to notice this with me. Paul said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now when he said, I didn't come to you with excellence of speech or wisdom, he doesn't mean divine wisdom, he means the wisdom of men. He said, it wasn't in my speaking ability or in the wisdom of men. He said, I determined not to know anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse three, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power. Why? Look at verse five. This is powerful. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Brethren, he, God does not want us to be just fawning over the preacher or the teacher and their ability to do whatever they do so well. He wants us to be captivated by his word and by his son. That's what it's about. And this is the self-promotion that I'm talking about where we're using these schemes and these ideas, hey, we can all go out there and find ways to be better at drawing attention to ourselves, but that's not what it's about. We might fill a building. The church might grow because our preacher's really good at that. But I want to tell you, the body of Christ is not growing. Just because you're adding people and the number's growing doesn't mean that the body is growing. You know, an old dead cow swells up and gets bigger. I mean, there's a sense in which it grows, but that's, that's not the kind of growth we want. And that's what's happening in these churches that are following after those that are making it all about themselves. And there is the idea, all, not only of dynamic speakers, but of drama, changes in worship. They're trying to, to change the, the singing in some way that's going to touch the heartstrings. And look, singing is emotional. But it is the words that we are singing in praise that should be touching our hearts. We're singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The Lord's Supper. There was a congregation a number of years ago, back, back around the time that I first started preaching. Congregation out on the West Coast where the brethren were complaining that the Lord's Supper just didn't feel like it, 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 it just didn't feel like it ought to. The preacher told the brethren that he was going to conduct the Lord's Supper the next Lord's Day. And so he showed up dressed like Jesus to serve the Lord's Supper. Oh, got so many people right there, you know, right in their fields. But it didn't do anything spiritually. That's a, you want the Lord's Supper to mean something to you? You leave here and Monday through Saturday, you offer your body a living sacrifice. You take up your cross and you suffer for the cause of Christ. And next Lord's Day, that supper is going to mean something to you because you will be a partaker of his sufferings. We don't need some kind of easy button. We don't need our emotions tugged at by some gimmick. You know, that, when I, that, that first year of my preaching, I went to a lectureship at Oklahoma Christian University and, and very institutional uh, speakers that were there, but there was one there uh, that, that from Tulsa that, that put on the Tulsa workshop. And he was saying that it, in order for the church to grow in the 21st century, the church was going to have to get a gimmick. And, and he went on, he said, yeah, we're, we're going to have to get a gimmick like they had on the day of Pentecost. And I thought, what was their gimmick? He said, it was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. He called the Holy Spirit a gimmick. I was looking for the door. I thought God's going to strike that building right there. But that's the mindset that so many people have. We need to use a gimmick. And brethren, that's all we're doing when we're just trying to entertain people or move people. 
They think that they can't be edified unless they feel something, unless there's a, some change in worship that excites them and surprises them. That's a gimmick. You know, when I was a kid, I, I, I had two older brothers. I say I had. One of them has passed away. But I had two older brothers that they were the, had to be the two meanest boys in the county. They'd hold me in a red ant bed and make me dance, you know, just... I, I, I could tell you all kinds of stories. But one time they, they said, Brett, hey, we're going to pull your spirit right out of your body. I said, I don't think I want you to. They said, no, no, you, wait till you feel this. You're not going to die. And so they held me down. And, and, and one of my brothers, he, he grabbed my wrist and he squeezed it tight and held it for a long time. My hand turned white. And I didn't know what was happening. He said, are you ready? I'm going to pull it right out. And I said, no, I'm not. And he said, hold on. And he let go. And, and he did that. And the blood was rushing back into my hand so fast, it almost came out my fingers. But it felt like he pulled my spirit out of my hand. And I was scared to death. I mean, I went around the rest of the day thinking, I, I got to do that again. You know, just because we feel something, doesn't mean that it's what they say it is. Just because you had an emotional feeling doesn't mean you were edified. Edification comes as a result of the word of God and the power it has to convict and to comfort, to strengthen, and to motivate. We've got to make sure that we understand that these gimmicks, that's not what we need. And let me say this, with this wonderful group of young people here, and I know I've already used up more than enough of my time. Young people, let me assure you that you need the same thing that everyone else here needs. There is not some unique need that you have. Now granted, there are challenges with youth, there are uh, 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 youthful lusts, and there are things that we need to discuss, that we need to talk about. There, there is, God's word addresses those things and we need to preach on those things, we need to teach on those things. Let me tell you what you need. As a young person, you need sound gospel preaching and teaching. You need faithful brethren to build you up, to love you, to look out for you and to hold you accountable. You need faithful elders to look out for your soul. That's what you need. Now, there can be a lot of other things that we do. I, I love to hunt, I love to fish, I love to camp. There are a lot of things that we can do together and those are great to do. But I want to tell you what is going to make you a faithful Christian, Christ established on the day of Pentecost and it is a faithful local church. Ephesians chapter four and verses 11 through 16, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Listen to verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body, Young, old, middle-aged, married, unmarried, the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, I, don't misunderstand me. We need hospitality. That's a, that's a part of our work as, as children of God. We need one another. But what you need for your spiritual growth is found in a faithful local church. And let me say this too, that young people, you do not need the scriptures dumbed down into some current or progressive language or lingo. Don't buy into these schemes. We have a youth lectureship there at Southside, and, and in a way, it, when we first started doing it, it was kind of the anti-youth lectureship. We were trying to do everything that wasn't being done in the other ones. We weren't using all of the faddish ideas. We just are teaching and preaching the gospel there. That's what you need. But what you're seeing happen in a lot of these places is, is trying to grab you by essentially making the, this gospel almost dumbed down where it's just real plain. There's not a lot of scripture. They talk about the scriptures. 
What we need is to challenge young people, brethren. Young people are sharp, they're deep, they're spiritually minded, and they want to be challenged. But in order to do that, we've got to have a passion for Christ, genuine. We've got to have a genuine passion for the Word of God. We have to love the Word, be excited about the Word, and when we teach it, that's going to be infectious. And they're going to see that, and they're going to be drawn to that. And that demands that we study, preachers. We've got to do the preparation. We can't get a canned sermon off the internet and provide what is needed. We've got to study, and we've got to show a genuine passion and excitement for God's Word. We all need application, but we don't starve their need for Scripture upon which the application is made. You know, sometimes I hear preachers talking about connecting with people. And these are those that use a lot of anecdotal uh, uh, proofs or, or, or efforts in their preaching. And I've used anecdotes tonight, used them yesterday. I'm not against that. But listen, anecdotes, personal experience, that does connect with people. That, that's great. Somebody has said, well, people don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. I, I understand that to a certain degree. But I want you to consider John's preaching and Jesus' preaching. We've got to ask ourselves, are we more interested in connecting or in convicting? Jesus said in the book of John, in chapter 16 and in verse 8, that the Holy Spirit, through his word, is going to convict them of their sins. That's what gospel preaching is. Is about. And the difference in connecting and convicting, connecting is not risky. Connecting is, it, it, we don't offend anyone. We don't lose friendships, but convicting is messy. It's risky. We lose relationships. People are repelled by the gospel many times when they're convicted, when they're cut to the heart. You see in Acts 2, they were cut to the heart and they obeyed. In Acts 7, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on Stephen with their teeth. That's what happens when we convict. Convicting is what's needed. Connecting only will fill a building, but it will not build up a body. I'm not against connecting. I want to connect with my audience, but primarily the preaching of the gospel is to convict people of the truth and of the Christ and of his glory. Again, I've used up more than enough time. I appreciate your kind attention this evening. Let us be assured that God's word will do exactly what he said that it will do. It is sufficient. It will not return to him void. Let us hold that word up. Let us demand in every pulpit that there be gospel preaching and God will be glorified and the growth will be there. If you're here this, e this evening and you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, we don't want to leave here without extending the invitation of Jesus Christ to come believing in him, confessing your faith, repenting of your sins, and being baptized in water for the remission of sins. You can do that tonight before it's too late. All things are ready. And if as a child of God, there's anything in your life that is, as, is hindering your relationship with God that you need to make right, then do that before you leave. And if you need our prayers, if you need accountability, if you need our help in any way to be right with God before you leave tonight, come forward and make that known. Let us know how we can help you. Won't you do that while we stand and sing the invitation song?